this video, we're gonna introduce a new tool that this gentleman over here has, uh, has developed initially. Um, and this tool called the Edgeworth Box um, is used in public economics and also in other fields in economics, such as international trade, to study general equilibrium graphically. And you will see this is a tool that initially it, it takes some time to get used to, but um, it's also very, very useful because you can condense a lot of information um, and in, into you know, an A4 sheet basically and, and, and understand a lot better how markets are interdependent and ultimately what government intervention can do then or how government intervention works in interdependent markets. So that tool goes back to an Irishman, actually, um, Francis Edgeworth, who was born in Longford and then attended Trinity before moving on to England. Um, so he was professor at King's College in, in London and later at Oxford. And he was also one of the founders of uh, the Economic Journal and uh, for a long time, the editor. Um, and the Economic Journal until this day is one of the most prestigious journals in economics. So this is a very important economist who is, who is known all over the world. Um, probably the Irish should actually be more proud of him uh, than, than uh, they, actually, they actually are. So a lot of people don't know that he's actually Irish. So uh, what is an Edgeworth box? Um, simply put, it's, it's a rectangle, okay? It's, it's, it, obviously there's nothing fancy about a rectangle. Um, if I develop a rectangle, it's, it won't be called the Elsner box. Um, so it's all about what that rectangle is really used for uh, in the analysis. And uh, you can see here uh, what we do with this rectangle first of all, which is that this, this, this box that you can see here um, shows all the feasible consumption plans. Now, if you remember last time, we had two people, Andrew and Betty, and each of them owns a certain number of goods. So we had two goods. And it was the case that Andrew owned, I believe, five of good one and one unit of good two, and Betty owned two units of good one, six units of good six. Uh, sorry, six units of good two. Okay. So if we think about Andrew and Betty constituting an economy, right? So it's a two-person economy, then overall there are seven units of of good one in this economy, and there are seven units of good two. And so the Edgeworth box tells us all the points that can be feasible consumption plans. Okay, so, so if, you, if you take a point exactly in the middle, what does that mean? Well, it means that Andrew and Betty each own or consume three and a half of each good. Right? Whereas we can also be in a, in a very extreme point, for example, here, whereby Andrew would not consume anything and Betty would consume seven units of every good. This is not a question of whether this is fair or not. It's simply a question of, is it feasible? And yes, it's feasible. It's, it's possible that one person consumes everything. But what is not possible is that one person consumes, let's say, eight units of good one. So we cannot be in a place somewhere out here or, or out here, right? because that's not feasible with the resources we have at our disposal in that economy. And what the, the Edgeworth box tells us is basically what are the boundaries of the, the resources um, that, that we, can, we, we have at our disposal in terms of uh, in terms of consumption so to go back then to the to the notation um so the the consumption plans here are um for andrew what 
number of units of good one Andrew consumes and how many units of good two and the same then uh, the same goes for 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 Betty hmm? um, now we can also uh, think um, about the endowment points so remember what we are looking at here is an exchange economy okay? so so here we're not producing anything it's it is the case that both members of that economy initially own a certain number of each good and then they can trade okay and remember in the last video we called these these points that of their initial endowments the initial the, the goods that they initially own before they trade the endowment points and so remember the endowment points were um w a uh, sorry omega a and omega b and then omega a uh, so andrew's endowment equals andrew's endowment of good one plus Andrew's endowment of good two. I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see that. Um, at the same in and in the same fashion, we can also uh, look at the endowment overall in the economy for good one. That's uh, that's omega one, and omega one equals however much uh, Andrew consumes of good one and how much. Betty consumes of, of good one taken together. Okay? So again, here the intuition is we have, let's say, seven units of good one, and those seven units will be split between Andrew and Betty, um, but obviously no one can consume more than seven, and also the two of them together cannot consume more than seven. Okay? And the same goes then also for good two. And so it's We've seen in uh, in this slide that the length of the uh, of the edges of the Edgeworth box are exactly the uh, the total endowments of of each good. So so this side here, this would be omega one, and this would be omega two. Right. So so that that arrow at the top is omega one. The arrow on the side is omega two. And so the way we measure uh, consumption is we measure them from the corners of the box. So I, I admit that this graph may look a bit confusing. So we'll, we'll look at it uh, is step by step. Okay, so, so let's look first here at an Edgeworth box. Again, we have here Andrew and we have here Betty. We have here good one and here good two two and now let's let's say we have an endowment point which the endowment point tells us exactly how many goods um, of how many units of each good each person owns before trading right so so we we said in the last video that Andrew owns a lot of good one but not much of good two and vice versa for Betty. So the endowment point, the initial endowment point is about here. Okay, so, so, so that, um, this is how much the initial endowment of good one for Andrew is. And that then is the initial endowment of good one for Betty. We can also then look at the endowment for good two, where we know that Betty owns more than, than Andrew. So everything from here to here, that's Betty's initial endowment of good two. And everything from here to here is Andrew's endowment for good two. Okay. But now suppose they, they trade um, and so Andrew gives up some of his endowment of good one. Betty gives up some of her endowment of good two, um, and 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 they, they they simply exchange. Then they might reach a different consumption point. So the consumption point could be somewhere. Could be somewhere in here. 
Okay, so so I'm I'm denoting the, the point here and I'm calling the point x. Okay? And so uh, you, you can see here how there is this difference between endowments and consumption and that comes from trading. So, so we can also denote in the Edgeworth box then uh, the, the consumption. So here you can see the consumption for Andrew of good, good one and apologies, the consumption of Betty for good one. Okay. Whereas then here on the vertical axis, we can also then draw the consumption of Betty of good two. And here we have the consumption of Andrew of good two. Okay. And so you can see here that when you compare the length of the red and the green lines, they are different. Yeah, and they're different because the through trading, the two market participants moved from their initial endowments to a different point. And so let's quickly go back to the um, the uh, initial endowment and let's think how we incorporate people's preferences in this Edgeworth box. So in one of the previous uh, videos, we have learned that we express people's preferences through utility functions and utility functions if they're well behaved. So if people have transitive preferences, if we have non cessation, we have indifferent, we can express uh, people's preferences via indifference curves. Okay, so here we have two goods and each person has preferences over these two goods and they can be expressed by indifference curves. So from the perspective of, of Andrew, the indifference curves go away from this origin. They should normally be parallel, but you, you get the gist of it, I hope. Um, right, and so, so the further I'm, I'm away from the origin, from Andrew's origin, so let's call this IC1 and IC4, um, the, the, the better it is, the higher is the level of utility that Andrew attains through his, his consumption. Um, right, so, so, so the indifference curve four uh, indicates a much higher utility level that the than the indifference curve one. So from the position of Betty, it's exactly the other way around, right? So, 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 so if you if you could turn the Edgeworth box from um, for, by 180 degrees and and would have Betty here in in that corner, um, her indifference curves would also go away from uh, from the origin. We can also do this uh, simply in in the Edgeworth box. So from the perspective of Betty, the further away we go from her origin, the higher is the utility level. So again. So let's call this IC1 prime and let's call this level IC4 prime. IC4 prime is clearly a higher utility level than IC1 prime. So now we, let's take those two things together, the endowment point and the preferences of both market participants. And the starting point here is the indifference curve namely the level of utility each would get from consuming their endowment. And that's what you can see here as those, those two black indifference curves that go through the endowment point. And what we can see here as well is that there is a lens that opens up here. Okay, there's this, this area shaded in blue. And whenever such a lens uh, is visible, that indicates that there are gains from trade. Why is that? Well, you can think that at any point within this, this lens, so let's say if you take a point here, um, I, can, I can make at least one person, if not both, better off. At that blue point, actually both. Okay, so, so if I have 
a, an indifference curve for Andrew here and an indifference curve for Betty there. And I call that blue point, that blue dot X. Then at that point, uh, both are better off than at the initial endowment point omega. So we can see here that, that there are actually gains from exchange, even in this very primitive economy. And obviously you can make this a lot more complex and sophisticated, but, but this is just, just the start of how we can graphically analyze that and think about uh, gains from, from, from market exchange, or gains from exchange on a market. So once again, the endowment point, if everyone consumes their endowment, the utility level they both get is lower than when they trade. Okay? And so, so, so that's why they, they both have an incentive for trade and basically uh, Betty gives up some of her endowment of good two in exchange for Andrew giving up some of his endowment of good one. So we already covered a lot of ground here. We have talked about the Edgeworth box, which is the set of all possible consumption plans that are feasible. We have looked at people's initial endowments. We have looked at people's preferences and how we incorporate them. Now, the final ingredient we need here is the budget constraint. Because as it is in, in the models you've of consumer choice that you've talked about in intermediate micro, we have here constrained optimization. So every market participant has a budget constraint and maximizes the utility within that constraint or subject to that constraint. So the budget constraint in an Edgeworth box is, is will also just be a straight line um, that looks exactly the same as the budget constraint you're familiar with. Okay? So, what is the budget constraint mathematically? You can see this up here. Um, it means that the, the, the total budget um, for person A, so for, for Andrew or for person B, equals the, that person's endowments times the prices for each of those goods. Hmm. And so from that, we can for each person um, derive what their um, what their their budget constraint looks like. All right. So we have to make one leap here, which is the the budget constraint you see up up here. That is when we look at people's endowments, but we should also then think or we can also look at it from the perspective of people's consumption um, and we know that uh, they cannot consume more than what their endowments are or what the value of their endowments is. Okay, So you can also write it as YH equals the price of good one times person H's consumption of good one plus the price for good two times uh, person H's consumption of good two, right? And when you solve this, so you you solve here for for x two H, okay? So 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 you 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 know you you bring. Um, let's do this very quickly. Um, so you you would start with. Uh, P two X two H equals Y H minus P one X uh, X one H, and then uh, we would simply divide by P two, and so we are at X two H equals Y H divided by P two minus P one over P two X one H, and again this this is a very simple um, uh, linear equation with a uh, with a clear interpretation namely this is the interset and that is the slope so we know that the slope for the budget constraint 
is nothing more than than the the relationship of the price for good one relative to the the price for good two. Um, and so if we start at the uh, if if we if we have a situation where both people have a given endowment, then the budget constraint is always determined by these endowments. Okay, because no one can consume more than what the value of their endowments is. Okay, if 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 Andrew owns an endowment that is worth 10 or 20, then he cannot consume more than whatever that endowment is, 10 or 20. Right? He can trade with Betty, um, but he will not be able to spend more than that. And for that that reason, the the budget constraint has to pass through the original endowment point. So this is what we this is what we see here. Okay, so so the, the, the budget constraint, I'm just gonna call it BC here, um, is that straight line that passes through the endowment point. Now here we see a situation where at that price level, remember that the, the slope here was um, minus P1 over P2. Um, at that price level or at that price ratio, we have a situation where we have what's called excess demand. So what does that mean? It means that Andrew demands so many units of that good, Betty demands so many units of that good, but there is basically this, this area in between here, which is excess demand. So, so they taken together, they want to consume more than seven units of that good, which is what is in total available in that economy. And so what's going to happen? Can this be an equilibrium where supply of good one equals demand for good one? No, it can't. Right? And so what's, what's going to happen is that prices are going to change. The relative price of good one relative to good two is, is, has to go up. Okay? Because in, in order to reach an equilibrium. So basically that excess demand that's indicated here has to go to zero and the prices that change in through through trade are actually what what brings supply and demand together. How this exactly works we will look at in the next video.